Today I'm speaking with Lauren Holt. And Lauren, you are a former graduate student from a master's in counseling program. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And and you decided to leave over some of the issues in the educational process and the ideology and how this was impacting the the teaching and also probably the practice, I can imagine. Yeah. So all of yeah. this. And I don't know that much about your story, so I'm really excited to have the chance to hear yeah. what, what that's been like for you. Can you tell me a little bit about what brought you to the study of counseling in the first place? Yeah. Um, I, I was a teacher for a long time. I still am as an adjunct teacher, but it's not really my, my full paying profession anymore, but I was for about 10 years and I really loved the connection that I got from teaching, but I was always broke. Um, not that counseling would have solved that, but <laughs> I was always really poor and I was just getting fed up with, with the exploitation of education. And so I had um, built a bookkeeping and accounting practice in my mid twenties alongside teaching, uh, which I love. And I became trained as an accountant that took over my professional life in my late twenties, early thirties. And long story short, I started realizing some years into that, that I really miss connection with people. And although I'm great with numbers and I'm a very good accountant, the connection with people is not something I, or the meaningful connection, I suppose I should say, is not something I was getting enough from that field. And um, so this was quite a few years ago now, but I thought, you know, well, what could I do? I don't want to get a PhD and try and be a professor. And counseling seemed from how I envisioned it would be to be really a good fit for me because I, I enjoyed the one-on-one -on -one work as a teacher. Um, I enjoy the one-on-one -on -work, one -on -one work as an accountant too. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that that one-on-one -on -one listening would, would be very present, of course, with therapy. Um, I also think psychology is interesting and I just thought it was a good fit for me. Um, there were a few aspects of the field that I, I was always wary of. The licensure regulations felt really rigid, mm -hmm. which they are. Um, and I'm not really into rigidity. So that, that struck me as a little bit odd from the start when I first researched, there were a couple other things where I was like, mm, I don't know, this might be hard for me, but I figured that in my mind, what I was envisioning, the advantages of that field were going to outweigh those disadvantages. And so I figured I would try. And I'd already gone to graduate school for um, an education based degree some years prior. So I'd had that experience and it was a big decision to go back to graduate school. You know, I know you've been a couple of times and it's, it's a lot. And I, but I felt like it was the right thing to do, at least initially <laughs> before I started. Yeah. So there was an appeal in the one-on-one -on -one work, working with clients or patients one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And it sounds like it was going to utilize, you were going to be utilizing some of your skill set as a teacher in yeah. that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like listening to people. Um, I mean, it can be hard, but I enjoy it. And I find, I find deep conversations enjoyable, even if they're difficult. Um, and so, you know, really when, when people ask, well, why did you want to go? Or why do you still have pain around not having finished? It's really just that it's <laughs> not, it's that I, I really did long to have, um, a job that would allow me more of that, that deep interpersonal connection with mm -hmm. other human beings on a, on a more personal level than on mm -hmm. the whole classroom or than dealing with finance and stuff mm -hmm. like that. <clears throat> had you had any experiences with counseling yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I had been to therapy on and off, um, in my mid and later twenties, some in my thirties too. I'd seen a career counselor at one point. She was really great. I mean, we didn't, <laughs> I've always been a little bit of an existentially conflicted person. So I don't know how much progress she and I made, but she was cool. Um, yeah. And I, I, I had not utilized counseling very much when I was an undergrad, mm -hmm. which I wish I had in retrospect. Um, but yeah, I had, I had quite a bit of experience being on the other side of the, mm -hmm. of the equation. So you probably had a sense of what you expected it to be like working in that field based on those experiences. Yeah. And, and to that point, most of the therapists that I had had, I mean, I hadn't had a million, but I, you know, I'd tested some out. I'd had some bad ones. I'd mm -hmm. had some good ones. 
most of them had been older though and okay. they had been trained <laughs> the way that therapists used to be trained and i don't want to i don't want to say that i think they they were necessarily trained much better in the past you know i'm not all about like oh let's go back to the way things were that's not really my attitude about anything but i do think that um <laughs> they were trained to be therapists hmm. which i'm not entirely sure a lot of counseling and therapy programs are doing right now and i think that it seems to me from my experience that that change has happened a lot in the last like i want to say four or five years especially since 2020 mm -hmm. um, but i could be wrong you know maybe that shift was starting before that yeah it yeah. sounds um it sounds like similar to myself you had this picture of what what does it mean to be a therapist? What does it mean to be a counselor? And mm -hmm. this was, I'm sure that we both were expecting to have that picture fine-tuned as we went through the process of learning. Yeah, but well put. For me, I really was surprised. It was, the way I was being educated was totally in, in opposition to that in some ways. Yes. What was it's your experience? And when did you start to feel, what did, when did you start to think this isn't what I expected? Right. Well, I remember <clears throat> that on the very first day of class, I was, I it was in, um, on zoom actually. So I was like in class kind of on a computer. And I remember the first reaction I had that was not positive was that my teacher that day was so incredibly disorganized, like, and that, and that can happen. I've been a teacher. So I, I say that with empathy, but I mean, it was really like, she hadn't even thought about the class at all. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of <clears throat> college education and I have a lot of um, experience as a teacher too. And this was really like the most unprepared first class I'd ever attended or taught myself, you know, in any, like I'd ever witnessed mm -hmm. <laughs> on either side of the aisle. And I remember it was very expensive private school. And I remember just kind of having a little moment, a little twinge of like, mm, mm -hmm. hope they're not all like this. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think they would be. I just remember that that first day. And and that 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 marked, you know, my gut noticed right from the beginning that there was an unprofessionalism, which continued throughout that whole program. There was really only one professor that I had who was who was quite a good teacher. He was not he I had problems with him on other levels, but he was a good educator and he was always ready. Mm -hmm. um, but I noticed that, you know, they were just really not very prepared for class. It's like I felt, I always felt that their lives were spread too thin. I, mm. and I don't know anything about their personal lives. It was kind of like, are you guys running private practices <clears throat> and trying to be tenure track teachers and mm -hmm. like whatever else it's like, make, make a choice. Like, what are we doing here? You know? Yeah. And I noticed that a lot with people in the therapy profession do not seem to <laughs> honor the, the tenant of self-care that they're constantly mm. preaching, you know? And I noticed that right from the beginning, but in terms of, <clears throat> more of like the woke culture stuff, you know, that, that, that you talk about with radical center and that's of interest to us. I, I noticed very quickly that there was a cultishness to the education. There was like, there were theories that particularly critical race theory that were constantly brought up and keywords that were constantly used. And if you didn't use them in the right way or use them enough or kind of nod and acknowledge whatever was whatever theory was being pushed at you it's like you you got some pushback or you got some looks mm -hmm. and I'm not really when when I started this program I didn't know anything about critical race theory actually to be honest what um, year was it I, I forgot to ask you what year you started okay 2020 and <clears throat> um that makes me sound, I suppose, kind of ignorant because I'd been in education for so long, but it was not, I don't think it was quite as uh, prominent in social discourse at that time. And and I hadn't, and I'm not on social media. So I was really kind of just like, oh, okay, well, this is interesting. I'm curious to learn about it because mm -hmm. um, I consider myself an open-minded person. And I, of course, really care about diversity and equity. I was an ESL teacher for years teaching immigrants. Like I don't, you know, I don't only care about white people or like any of the stuff that a lot of us white people seem to get accused of a lot. Like it was, 
you know, but I felt like the theory, we couldn't question it. We couldn't mm -hmm. question anything in class. And that was the, that was what was disturbing to me as a student was feeling like I couldn't, like there was only one way of thinking that was mm -hmm. permitted. And if you just wanted to open a debate just for the sake of debate, or if you felt that there was something that was like kind of too subjective, that there wasn't space for that. You know, it's and really I was to find out I was very right that there was not space to ask questions. I'm, I, you know, I'd love to hear more about what those experiences were like. If you want to give examples, it's interesting to me that you also talk about the unprofessionalism of the program. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't have to say the name of the school if you don't want to, but it wasn't Antioch, right? No, it was not. It was, it was totally a different. private Jesuit school in the South. Okay. Um, the, yeah. the school that I, you know, when I went back to graduate school, that was one of my, th I haven't really talked about that very much, but that was a really big part of my experience. Also was the sloppiness of the program. Yes. Sloppy it was great. very disorganized and it felt like, no, like they were kind of building the plane as they were flying it kind of yes. it just, it, and the, I had like the, the first set of grievances that I raised mm. were, as much about procedural stuff as about the the content of the class. It was very sloppy and students were really upset. I had some students who were nearing the end of the program saying that they felt like they wish they could run a campaign warning students away from the program because it was yeah. such a nightmare to try to finish this thing. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I I relate to what you just said because my initial grievances and complaints, a lot of which were just through email, then they were through this more formal procedure that maybe we'll end up talking about, but um, we're totally about that kind of thing too. It was like, mm -hmm. why haven't I heard back from a professor about my grade for three months? Yeah. I don't even care about grades. Like, honestly, yeah. I've always gotten pretty good grades. So I've never been like, oh God, you know, what's my grade? But quite literally, like we would be in the dark with most yeah. of our teachers for the whole semester like no concept, like we, they'd have these strict deadlines, you know, for papers, which as a, as a teacher, I respect having deadlines. I understand why teachers have to do it, you know, but everyone would be stressing to get these big papers in these complicated assignments that were often not well explained yeah. at all. Right. And like no response to it whatsoever. We had this one teacher who call, uh, contacted a bunch of us, everybody that I knew from that class to tell them she'd made a grading error and she changed everybody's grades on the final, the biggest paper of the semester, but she did it six weeks into the new semester. Hmm. So she rescinded everybody's grades after they were already, uh, you know, the you grades had already been turned in. I didn't think that you could, but she rescinded all the grades and then gave everybody a very short deadline to rewrite this paper. And it was already the following semester and we were midway through. And it was kind of this giant nightmare for a lot of people. I know at least one person dropped out of the program over that. And there were other incidences like that. And I wonder, as we're building in, it's it's kind of interesting, because I feel like there for me, and, and I wonder if this was like this for you, the um, there was, it felt like there was a bit of a parallel, like we were learning these really good concepts, like I had some classes that were teaching good, solid concepts, like sure. uh, based on group therapy or you know the counseling skills or or something right. like that alongside this the social justice stuff that seemed to contradict the stuff that you were being taught yeah. over here and I wonder if that causes some kind of a breakdown and the whole structure is just falling apart because they can't find a coherent sense of identity as a program Right. And I think that 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 what you just said about a coherent sense of identity and not being able to find it, mm -hmm. I think that is fundamentally a huge problem with the therapy field in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at how many different acronyms there are for therapists in our mm -hmm. country. There's like over 50. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like different networks. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah. Like, no, well, there's all different versions of LPC, LPCC, LCHM, you know, yeah. MFT, MFTC, like I think there really are over 50 in the nation and, and then there's all the battles between social workers and counselors and 
and marriage and family and all of these, this infighting and this lack of, of like clear purpose. Like, what are mm -hmm. we doing? We're here to help people. We're not here to exercise our egos, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's a bit of a um, digression, but, but I do think that there's a performativity to what's going on in these schools right now. I think in, in higher ed in general, there's a mm -hmm. lot of performativity in the world in general. There's a lot, mm -hmm. um, trying not to get in trouble, trying to do the right thing, trying not to lose your job. Mm -hmm. And the and the school that I went to, and it sounds like Antioch might have been similar, they're overdoing it. Mm -hmm. They're losing sight of what they're really there to do, in my opinion. And most of the students are feeling that, I think. Most of the students that, that I spoke with felt that way. Um, most people who go to graduate school, well, I don't know if I should say most. That's assumptive. In my experience, most of the people I've known who go to graduate school you know, slog through and finish it. Um, some folks decide not to for various reasons, but it it seemed to me that the student body that I was a part of was overall just pretty confused by the program and that they didn't really feel like uh, they were learning what they were there for, but there was a, there was a faction that seemed to to have really bought into the social justice narrative and were seemed to just be there to militantly promote that. Mm. That's how it felt to me, at least not being part of that faction was mm. that they, you know, they feel like that's the way therapy education should be. But then a lot of us are like sitting there like, wait a minute, what are we signing up for? But then you're, then you're invested in it. Right. And it's hard to leave. You've put all this money in, mm -hmm. you've gotten in, mm -hmm. It's a dream, even if it's becoming disillusioning and it's not really what you thought it would be. Mm -hmm. um, so all of yeah. your classes were online for for this program? Yeah, so um, my classes for that program were online. I ended up transferring to a different program in California that I left for a completely different reason that's kind of irrelevant to Radical Center, I would say, but that program was half online, half in person. Okay. Um, so I kind of went through, I went and, and <laughs> so I've been to two counseling schools and I've experienced similar things at two different counseling schools in two different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's indicative of, mm -hmm. of how endemic this issue is, you know, it's not just like, Oh, it's one, one school that's kind of going crazy. It seems to be, uh, a professional issue at the moment so even though it was on your most of your engagement was online with these other students you became aware of a subset of students that seemed to be really supporting this kind of ideological thinking yeah. and then another subset that wasn't really comfortable with it Definitely. so there was some way that that these things were being communicated and I'm wondering what were your what was could you give some examples or or walk through some of your your awakening to the issue how did mm. you become aware of this issue? What were the experiences like? And how did you become aware of what the students were were thinking or promoting around this? Right. So I didn't I didn't feel it. I wasn't quite as aware in the first semester. And I think that might have been um, just because we were all, you know, getting into it together, kind of getting to know each other. We're on Zoom. So everyone has a bit more of a boundary that way. Um, also, the classes in the first semester were much more content heavy, even though they were often disorganized, mm -hmm. like theory and stuff like that, where there's quite a bit more of substance to get through. And so I think there wasn't as much space for the for the hardcore social justice narrative to really seep in. Um, but in my second semester, they changed our multicultural counseling lab, which was supposed to be, I think it was like a one or two credit class that was in addition to taking group counseling. I'm sorry, it was the group counseling lab, not the multicultural. The group counseling lab was supposed to be where we practice group counseling. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and historically, from my understanding, you would like practice group counseling techniques in this lab. And I was really excited for that because I think group counseling seems interesting and quite challenging to, to facilitate. So we were informed, if I remember correctly, like within 
the semester that this lab was happening, like the week before it started that, oh, it's actually not going to be group counseling practice. You're still getting that credit. It's still Kate Krep approved, whatever, but it's, it's going to be something else kind of. So we go to this lab and these, these classes were quite a bit smaller than the group class, than the normal classes, maybe only like eight or 10 people. It wasn't led by a professor. It was led by this woman that they had hired. I, I don't know if she was a therapist or what she was, but she was like a critical race theory specialist. So this whole class, which was on Saturdays for two or three hours, was critical race theory boot camp. Wow. And that's all it was. Like we did not do any practice with group counseling technique at all. And I know because I was taking group counseling <laughs> So I was learning what those techniques were. We never practiced them in this lab at all. We really just studied critical race theory and we didn't have, we had these like performative conversations about it where, you know, she would sit there and be like, what do you think of what you read? But then if somebody didn't have a lot to say, or if someone kind of tried to be like, well, I don't know about this part. It's like, it was quickly circumvented and shut down. There was a student in that class who disappeared from the class. Um, she was, I think, in her thir third year. She was really quite brilliant. She'd already been published in a counseling journal, and she hadn't even gotten her master's yet, which is really hard in academia. It's hard enough to get published when you have a PhD. Um, so she was quite devoted to the field, is my point in mentioning that. And she was a great student, but she had... This I, I could tell from her facial expressions that like she wasn't really comfortable with this lab either. And there was a day where she answered a question in a way. I don't remember what she said, but there was something about how she said it that like apparently offended a couple people in the class. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was offensive. Mm -hmm. She vanished from the class. She was actually kicked out mid-semester. Nobody oh, she ever was kicked out. Do you remember what it out. what the no. kind of you don't remember what it was? That no, they it was about. very much like <clears throat> what I do remember is that she didn't say anything distinct. Like she didn't use some word that you're not supposed to use, or she didn't say anything that was distinctly like kind of taboo in today's culture at all. What she, what she did is she didn't really answer a question and then she was kind of cagey and then she was silent. Hmm. So it was very much like they interpreted her behavior to be offend much more offensive than probably what she intended. And I think what I what I remember feeling when I heard that she had been kicked out of that class, apart from just like sympathy and empathy and anger and all of those things, was that we were in a council we're in a counseling program, and there's a person who's sitting here who's clearly uncomfortable talking about something, and that's the solution. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> you know, shouldn't this shouldn't this be a moment almost for the leader to like model without maybe saying it explicitly how to bring someone in you know without without forcing them to be ideologically on board with what you're talking about you know what, what were you learning about group techniques at the same time that would have that would have made that situation look different I don't remember because it sounds like you're describing <laughs> something you're describing <laughs> an opportunity totally to bring something up in a way that that brings it into the group discussion or brings totally. the person in and folds in the experience that they're having uh, totally. in a way that's that, that everybody can benefit from. Totally. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember the techniques, you know, I can't, I haven't studied mm -hmm. it in a few years, but I definitely remember because that was fresh in my mind at the time mm -hmm. in that lab and just being like, well, we could be doing this, but we yeah. could be doing it now. And it was just very, it was very disillusioning. And after and she, she, and they didn't give you any, any reason for her leaving. She just disappeared. They, no, they did. They said okay. that, um, they said that, God, I wish I, I wish I had like a recording so I can remember how they put it, but they, they politely said that she had been talked to about how she had behaved that day and that a lot of students had felt uncomfortable. And then they, and then they opened up our lab to process our discomfort around her behavior. And I remember sitting there and being like, what was so uncomfortable about that? And, th and this is something else, you know, like that I think is really quite disturbing about the training today is there's a lot of, there's a lot of coddling mm -hmm. of therapy students. Like 
oh, you know, that, that one, the way that someone looked at you was, was such a severe microaggression that you can not come to class for a week. And it's kind of like, yeah, is that, how are you going to be a therapist? Mm -hmm. Like you're going to have to sit in the room with people. So this school was in Louisiana. So it was in new Orleans. I'm like leading you down the trail. Which school was it? <laughs> the school was in new Orleans, which is notoriously liberal, but Louisiana is notoriously the opposite of that. And getting, you know, after you graduate, you might get a position if you stay in that state to, to get mm -hmm. your hours. That's mm -hmm. in a very conservative part of the country. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm sitting there and I'm watching these students who are like offended by everything. Everything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is offensive to them. And I'm like, how are you going to be a mental health professional mm -hmm. anywhere, much less in America, much less in the deep South? You know, I that that really resonates. We were given special like days of of uh, processing for January 6th and for um the, when Russia invaded Ukraine, there was a, a whole day and, and it was like, we only had six weeks for a class. And so we're going to devote one sixth of that to just, just, if you need to leave today to go take care of yourself, go ahead and leave. The rest of us are just going to be here talking about how this feels. What does this feel right. like? So everything that we were supposed to be learning, I think this was an assessments class. We're supposed to be learning about really concrete things and discussing these things in the time allotted. And instead we're talking about how we feel about something right. that happened in another country. Right. And we're also being encouraged to pull up really deep feelings about it. So it felt very pro-fragility. Yeah, very much so. Pro-fragility is a good way of putting it. Yeah. When I went to the second program, which you know, like I said, I didn't have quite as much of a intense social justice experience there, but I took multicultural counseling at the program in California. And that class would be my biggest complaint from that program because it, we, we never had a real discussion about anything mm. the entire semester. It's like, we would show up and the teacher, again, would be totally disorganized, very nice, but very disorganized. And she'd just be like, so what's going on for everyone today? And I swear to God, for three hours, like, that's what we would do. It's just people kind of like complaining and and airing out grievances about what they're seeing in society. And, and not that there's not a place for that, you know, to maybe start a class, just kind of get a sense of the temperature of the room. And not that everything has to be concrete information, but I felt like when I first signed up for counseling school, I remember seeing multicultural counseling as one of the classes and having been an ESL teacher for so long, my mom's European, my family lives all over the world. I was like, oh, cool. This is totally going to be a class that I'm going to love, you know? And I expected that we might get into some like challenging conversations in a class like that. You know, my, my vision, my teacherly vision was like, okay, maybe we'll be in a little group. Maybe we'll address, maybe we'll kind of dive into some of our own inherent biases. Cause we all have them mm -hmm. and, and try and process that and, you know, learn to empathize with people around bias because that's so much of what impacts multicultural um, communication issues, you know, never. It was just like kind of complaining a lot of top, you know, issues about microaggressions of these little things. And then everyone in the class just being like, mm -hmm, you know, like nodding like robots. And I'm like, what are we doing? Really? Hmm. Like that was the feeling I had in so many classes is what are we doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Wow. That's really interesting. I, your description of what you would have hoped multicultural counseling would be really it maps well onto what I would have hoped as well. What I was right. hoping we would use that time for is, is for some real deep and honest discussions right? and, yeah. and something that led towards something positive, some kind of positive communication working towards acceptance. And instead it really felt like we're just tearing people uh, apart and tearing yeah. people down. Yeah. Yeah. And specific people. It's like, there's people that you're allowed to tear down and there's people that you're not. Mm -hmm. That's the current narrative, you know? And mm -hmm. I completely disagree with that. I don't think when I watched your interview actually with CTA, one of the thing that I remember most from it was when you were talking about your childhood in Texas. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and I I don't want to uh, remember it wrong, but what I recall was was you sharing how you had not grown up with a lot of privilege, even though you're white, and that it was it never really worked for you to be seen as someone who had a lot of privilege just because of the color of your skin, because that's not that was not the nature of your childhood. Well, it's also a problem with defining privilege, right? And yeah. and and just looking at someone and looking at their exterior and making assumptions it's 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 precisely the opposite of what social justice should be it's precisely the opposite of what equity is and that that irony the hypocrisy and the irony um those are two words that i feel like were constantly in my mind when i was studying counseling was like this is so hypocritical mm -hmm. you know even the code of ethics the aca code of ethics is full of things about you know <clears throat> honoring self-care and flexibility and all of these things and like does the counseling profession honor any of that for counselors no zero like do counseling boards <laughs> give people any flexibility no like it it just i felt like the entire i feel like the entire system is in contradiction to itself and in order to exist within it and survive within it you have to just kind of run yourself ragged. That's how, that's how it seems to me, you know, even though I never went through the process of finishing and getting licensed, you know? I think that's, those are really great observations. I like that the entire system is in contradiction to itself. I, I, yes. I think that's very well put. Yeah. How did you start to, how did you start to sense what the other students were thinking? And, and did, was it, it sounds like the group of people who were always offended that there's that group. How did that show up? And mm -hmm. how did you get a sense that there were other students who felt more like you did about this? Right. Good questions. So like I said, most of this really kind of blew up in the second semester, at least in my experience. Um, and I think that lab that I've spoken of mm -hmm. was a big part of the problem because I didn't mention this, but the lab was segregated by race. So oh, all the wow. white students, yeah. So all the white students, and of course the Hispanic students, because just like on any government documentation, white and Latinx is all together. Okay. Right? So ridiculous. Yeah. So we were all put together, and then all the black students were separate. Um, and how were you separated in an online class? Were you we were just in different in, groups? We were not allowed to roll in the same class as people of other race. Like we were intentionally not allowed to enroll. No, we were put oh, into wow. like they announced that same semester. Okay, guys, we've got to change the gears. It's not the actual group counseling lab hours that we had originally told you. These are the days that we're doing it. You're if you are of these identities, you're allowed to go to one of these classes. So tell us which day works better for you. And if you're one of these identities. So it was the way that they listed it was not like black and white. They said yeah. BIPOC and white, but they put all the Hispanic students with the white students. Um, so we're in this segregated lab. I bet that didn't go over that well. No, but it, most, most of the people that I was like friendly with, that I had phone numbers that I chatted with, you know, and texted that I became friends with, thought that was insane. Putting the Hispanic students with the whites um, or the, the segregation altogether? The segregation. The segregation. Okay. okay. But it seemed that, and, and I don't know how the how the people that I wasn't really friends with felt, but yeah. it seems that what that serves to do is strengthen the narrative for those who were on the social justice side. Because prior to that class, I had been like friendly with a couple of the black students, like they were, you know, I, we would work on papers together and text. I was in New Orleans for a couple chunks of time. Uh, I went down there, even though it was kind of like covid mm -hmm. um, to work on projects and stuff. <clears throat> and we were like, we had growing friendships. And after that lab, it's like, I never, I remember I texted one of those girls. I never heard back. Like there was a lot yeah. of there was a lot, there was a weird feeling of like, it, it broke apart the cohort wow. in a very weird way. And I was not the only person who experienced that. I had other friends who experienced the same thing. Um, 
made it awkward to connect with it made the, it awkward and it yeah. yeah and I have no idea what the BIPOC group talked about versus what we talked about I you know I'm I I couldn't tell you and that was like part of the design I feel of this program was like that we would have different experiences and that we shouldn't we shouldn't learn about the experiences of someone whose identity is different from us. Like that was like the kind of attitude, which I completely disagree with. It's like, if you're going to be able to work with people who are different and everyone's different than you, <laughs> but people who might be more different because of how they grew up, their identity, their race, whatever you need to interact. Yeah. Period. Like you can't, you can't segregate people and expect them to better understand each other. It's insane. So what, that was. Yeah. And what well, kind of things were you being told about? Uh, were you being given a heap of white guilt? What was it like? In yeah, the there was a lot. Of white, yeah. There was a lot of white guilt. It wasn't like. It wasn't nasty. It wasn't the, the woman who was leading the class. Again, I still don't even know what her like credential was, or I can't remember. I'm sure they told us um, she was black. She had a a former student from the program who was white kind of co-leading with her. Um, and they didn't, you know, they didn't shame us per se, but critical race theory in itself is really built on a lot of white guilt concepts. And I don't, I, I personally don't agree with that because I don't really think that guilt and shame are productive emotions to try and foster in people. We all experience them as human beings, but I don't think that they, they serve us. And I don't mm -hmm. think that like instilling people with guilt and shame intentionally is going to do anything for our society, period. That's my personal belief. And I haven't seen any evidence to convince me otherwise thus far in my life. So I would... I would sometimes kind of gently question the white guilt part, but I was always very wary of questioning a lot because it felt, it felt like a, the, the lab was designed not to have time for questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you had to interrupt in order to yeah, kind get of. your question. Yeah. The onus was on you to push against yes. them if you wanted to talk about it. Yes. And I was trying, you know, I've never been someone who, <laughs> for better or worse, I've never been someone who fears reprisal. I think you and I share this. I've always been someone who, if I, if I really feel something needs to be said, I will say it at the right time. When I was younger, I'd say it at the wrong time. Now I'm more mature and I usually do it at the right time. But, you know, I'm, I'm on the more outspoken side of the spectrum of society for sure. But that said, like, I was not trying to cause problems in my class. I was not trying to draw unnecessary attention to myself. I was really trying to like get through this and learn and grow. Mm -hmm. But again, as a teacher of many years, I feel like a big part of growing in a class is having deep discussions and feeling comfortable to question things. And my first graduate degree, totally different field, uh, you know, very liberal school as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. We questioned everything. Mm -hmm. That was what we like. That's what we did just partly because it's more interesting, mm -hmm. you know, just for the sheer entertainment of the thing, but also because it's important. Mm -hmm. That was not the way this was, you know? And so back to your question about like, when did I sense how other students were feeling? That was when I sensed it was in that second semester where like communication started to break down. Friendships started to kind of fragment. Mm -hmm. um, they segregated us, but when I, it all slapped me in the face for lack of a better metaphor, when I uh, responded to this group email with a question that was, that was kind of the beginning of my downfall as a student. Oh. Um, and the way that, that a small faction, again, it was not the majority of the students there, but the way that the people who decided to respond to that responded to me, made it very clear that there was there was a there were a group of students who were militantly in agreement with they were enforcers of this yes thing. they were enforcers mm -hmm. and and i like that you use that word because incidentally many of these students had been selected by the program to be the graduate assistants who you know at most programs get half their tuition off and kind of do some work for the school 
So they were all part of this um, <clears throat> graduate assistantship program called SARP, which stood for, if I remember correctly, Students Against Racial Privilege. Oh. Yeah. And so that wow. group, that group was not just like a club, you know, because universities have all sorts of clubs, people who are pro-Democrat, pro-Republican, whatever, like clubs galore. This was not a club. This was these were the graduate assistants who helped professors with grading. They were the graduate assistants who I learned. So this was very official, very folded. Very into, official. And it was students against racial what? privilege. Against racial privilege. Against racial privilege. Wow. So it was basically like a small <sighs> army of woke students who had, <laughs> ironically, a lot of privilege themselves within the program because they held a position of power over the rest of us because they were graduate assistants. Um, wow. And yeah, I'll, I'll see if you have any questions here. Cause the whole, the whole no. story, for lack of a better word of my downfall is kind of a story in itself of what I asked and how people reacted. And it's definitely relevant to our conversation, but if you want to. I'm thinking, any... was it, was it Victor Frankel in who wrote about the, um, other prisoners being given certain rights to, yes. over uh, over the others yes. in, in exchange for some kind of special yes. treatment or a little bit more food i'm just this is what i'm picturing as soon as you said this this is what i'm picturing yeah it's it was like messed. bringing from within the group a mm -hmm. subset that are then allowed to enforce yes uh, and regulate the others and how much more viciously um I guess militant those people were. And yeah, I, it's just, it's, yeah. I, I, this is the paradigm I'm picturing as you're saying this. Yeah, it's very Orwellian. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole thing, the whole thing was like it was, it was a, it was like a big ball of yarn. And when I first started, you know, it was like, oh, that's a little disturbing. They're a little disorganized. And oh, that's a little disturbing. And then very quickly it was like all unraveling. And I was like, this place is so awful. And all of my friends who who stayed and finished, I I've stayed in touch with like three people. The stories I heard from after I left too, it just it continued. It was not just like, oh, that one semester was rough and I kind of got the heat and things, you know, shit out of luck for Lauren. It it was really like it's still that way. It seems to be getting worse. Um so bad. if we can follow the narrative, so you, if just to kind of summarize the timeline, you had started this program, kind of clean <laughs> slate and in, in neutral stance on critical race theory and all these other, these yeah. other uh, multicultural, you had a neutral or even curious, positive perspective on what am I going to learn about this? This yeah, sounds totally. interesting. So Absolutely. you go in and first it's disorganized and so it's a little sloppy there's a red flag but okay the content is pretty good then yeah. you you're in this program the lab gets switched it's no longer a group counseling lab and it's a segregated race racially segregated lab where you're getting crt kind of distilled to you so it's being taught by somebody who's not even necessarily a therapy professional or a, right. or a therapy teacher she's a, she's a crt teacher and you have this experience with another student who tries to have some kind of dialogue that goes south and everybody, yeah. you don't remember what that was, but it seemed kind of innocuous to you. And yeah. it was blown up in the class yeah. to be this big thing. And so at this point, um, you are asking some questions, but it sounds like that's not the, that wasn't pivotal. It was some email that happened yeah. after this. And yeah. so when was that? And how did that, how did that happen? Yeah. So that was at this the end of my second semester. I want to say like in the last month, <clears throat> I was contacted by the the uh, white woman who was co-hosting that lab by email privately. This was not the group email. She notified me that she had known from a private meeting that I'd had with her. It was part of the class. Like we had to meet with them and see how we're doing or something privately. And I was honest and I was like, well, you know, I'm finding the class like a little this, that, and the other. And I'm also kind of finding the program in general, just kind of disorganized. And, and most of my, most of my complaints were very pragmatic. They were just about like how it was being run and stuff, you know, even though I was disturbed by the cultishness and she had heard that. And 
she emailed me and she said, well, I'd like to invite you. You're not the only student who's been complaining. She was very vague, but she's like, we, the, the department is getting an outside mediator to mediate between students and faculty because there's been so many complaints of various natures by students. So I'd like to invite you to the mediation. You're not going to be the only one there. There'll be a lot of people there, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, okay, you know, I'll go. This is interesting. So I go and I expect this mediation. I want to say this was like in April, March or April of that second semester. I expected maybe like, I don't know, 10, maybe 20 people to be there. It was like seriously almost the entire department all three years. There were over 100 people in the Zoom room. They had an outside mediator that they'd gotten from Tulane, another university down there. Again, I don't know what her, you know, if she's a professional mediator, if she's a therapist, whatever, but she had a lot of mediation experience. She was probably an ombudsman or something. So they had her come in. And then they had um, a couple of the students from that SARP student group helping her like take notes. And the mediation, I only went to one of these and the mediation was a few hours and, and the whole, there were no professors. There it was only students and these external people and the two or three SARP members that were helping. And we were all just invited to spend about three or four minutes each sharing our grievances. And they took notes on a document. They shared the document on the Zoom screen. We all see what they were. It felt very neutral. Um, it felt safe to use the the word of today, you know, and the complaints were like kind of in two buckets. I would say there were a lot of people like me who were like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, why is my, why don't I get any answers to any of my emails when I email my professor? Like, where are my grades? The assignments we get make zero sense. Like mm -hmm. they're so confusing, you know, that kind of thing, just like professionalism. And that was the nature of my complaint. I actually did not bring up the the cultishness or any of that at the time even though i didn't like it um and then there was another kind of club of students who were very angry with one professor in particular he was the department head he was um a white cisgender guy he was incidentally my advisor and some of my complaints had also been about his unprofessionalism around advising not around teaching hmm. a lot of people in this group, most of them of marginalized identities had complaints about him in terms of uh, prone, like he had messed up some pronouns in class with one student, that kind of thing. So there mm. were complaints about him not being respectful of students' pronouns, him uh, being offensive. It was not so much about professional, it was about being offensive. And there was there weren't really a lot of complaints about many other professors. It was really kind of targeted at him. Mm. Um, and so anyway, we did this for like a few hours, the notes were taken and we were told, okay, well, you know, we, the mediation team, which seemed to be the mediator and these like two star people, wow, I, I don't really yeah. know, are going to go and collate and make these notes more, you know, succinct. And mm -hmm. we're going to talk to the faculty and have a mediation with them. And then we will let you guys know in a group email about next steps. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay. And I had like a, I had a semblance of hope, you know, I thought mm -hmm. maybe things improve here yeah so uh two weeks later maybe three weeks something like that we get an email and the email is from sarp it's from that student group and the email is quite long but it explicitly states in the very first paragraph like it goes it goes out the gates with the statement that the mediation will only be continuing for students of marginalized identities and the complaints of all students who are not marginalized are not going to be included in the mediation anymore, which is racist. What was Here. the, her, what was the justification for that? I don't remember. It was a long, you know, a lot of like, Oh my gosh. I Do you still have it. that email? It was, it was just so classic. It was like, yeah. it was, it wasn't like they, they put that at the end. It was right. It was clearly you know, they had an agenda Blatant. from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. And and my thought was when I read it, I mean, I was like pretty pissed when I first read it. But I, I remember thinking, OK, like I was in that mediation and there were kind of two buckets of complaints. You yeah. could split the mediation into two different mediations. There could yeah. be a mediation that's much more around like procedural stuff. 
Yeah. Procedural stuff. Because a lot of us, not mm-hmm. just white people, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people in the program are kind of pissed about how shitty this program is. And it's $10,000 yeah. a semester to be clear. Yeah. And there are also some complaints that are a little more serious in terms of like, you know, professors jobs and stuff. I mean, these are really serious allegations. Right. Um, and that are more around racism and identity mm-hmm. stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and every, but the point is all of us are students in this program. All of us are paying for this program. Yeah. All of us should have a voice. It does not matter what color your skin is. It does not matter what your identity is. That's insane. Yeah. And I didn't write that at all. I took some time and later that afternoon I responded and I asked one question I said so what about the rest of us who are not marginalized I find it hard to swallow that we don't have a place to talk in this program okay that question <laughs> that seems like a really good straight question really Just fair straightforward yeah really good yeah it, like they must know, have I been don't... wanting they must have been expecting someone That's... to ask this question they wanted they wanted a scapegoat okay and, and I <laughs> Lauren outspoken Lauren who doesn't have social media. Like I just, you know, I, I guess I just didn't really know how angry some spaces can be online, but within minutes I was, you know, jumped on electronically by all sorts of students. I'd never met students in other years of the program. I mean, I'd never met any of these people. So was this on a forum? It was on, it was like the school email but I responded to like the group setting. And so, okay, so it was like a reply all, and then it became like a yeah. forum of responses. Basically. Okay. Um, but the stuff that people wrote to me, yeah. I mean, it was unbelievable. Like, like people like, I'd never met calling me a bigot, okay. writing me whole letters about how I need to look at my white privilege. Um, there was one student in particular who cursed at me. I mean, it was, it was like aggressively violent, really messed up. Um, I had one student who I thought I had been friends with write me outside of that, like a week or so after it was shut down with a whole long letter, multi-page letter telling me all about myself and all of my problems. Oh my gosh. Um, so I was just, I was completely canceled. Wow. Within, I mean, I it it went on for about a day and a half before someone in the faculty shut it down and then it stopped. But I was I was within an hour, I had already basically been ostracized from the program. Oh just my for gosh. Us. How were you feeling? I mean oh, it was it, horrible. It feels like my absolute, stomach is churning just was, thinking about this. You know, Leslie, being canceled, <laughs> and some people get cancellation way worse than that. I mean, cancellation can be you know, it can become suicidal for people. Yeah. Yeah. I want to tell you being canceled is no joke. Like it is, it's awful. Yeah. And, and it, um, I was just, com- I was so confused. Like I felt really kind of naive. Like I really actually, I knew maybe someone would kind of like be like, well, because of, but I didn't expect that because I thought I'm in a program of people who are here to become listeners and who are here to support equity. And they're doing this because I ask a question about all of us having a voice. How does this make any sense? And so, yeah, it was very clear, very quickly that like, I was not welcome there, even though if you looked at the number of people that responded to me compared to the number of students in the program, the majority didn't do that, but it was enough of a group and they were loud and angry enough. And they had this, the identity statuses to have clout. And I knew right away that I couldn't, that I was so vicious. It was so vicious. And so. (laughs) So you took that very personally and you felt like you, you couldn't hard not to continue. Well, what happened is, you know, I was, I was deeply upset. My, Mm -hmm. your question about how did I know that some students agreed with me? I mean, I got, I got so many texts and calls that day from my friends in the program who were like, dude, I wanted to ask the same question. That's so fucked up how people are reacting to you. But none of them spoke up, right? Because I asked that, I get, you know, not immediately, but within a few hours of the email and I, they all saw what happened. And so and, it was like- And nobody chimed in. Anything. 
nobody said hey this this mobbing pile on she just asked a simple question no nobody, nobody. did the only yeah. thing was that the department had the guy who had been kind of the target of all the complaints in the mediation he just shut it down um and said you know deal with this outside of the platform but so, they let it go on for a while first at least a day okay and and what happened after <laughs> on the departmental level is that, so I was supposed to take summer classes because this, this school was year round, you know, um, I was enrolled in them. I had already enrolled, but I didn't feel comfortable and I needed to like take a leave. So I dropped those classes of my own accord. And then I was informed. I got an email from one of their like internship coordinators or something. She was an administrator, but not a, not a professor that, I would not be allowed to return. It had been the decision of the head of the department, the guy that I had complained about because of his unprofessionalism and that a lot of other people had complained about too. And he was aware of this. He knew that because he could see it through the content of that shared message. He'd already been in the faculty mediation. He knows that he's in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. That he had made the decision that I would not be able to return unless I... Um, I would have to take at least a semester off during that semester. I would have to attend so many hours of counseling. It was an absurd amount. It would equate to more than once a week throughout a semester, which, you know, it's very hard to get a therapist who's available that often. Right. And then I would be attending therapy around my inability to listen to people. Are you serious? I to have, yes. That I had to have that documented and turned in by the therapist. And I had to sign documentation to my incompetency, which would what? go on my graduate record. And and will you again paraphrase or tell us the 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 words that you used in your response to that email? Yeah, what, the what, question. Yeah, yeah, I wish I knew it verbatim, and I don't yeah. have access to that email anymore. But the question was: So, what about all of the issues of those of us of those of us who are not marginalized? I find it hard to swallow that we have no voice in this program. I and, remember and you you hit like a couple of hot buttons with that that phrase yes. that you hit like. What about not marginalized? And then they fl they flare yeah. up, they catch on fire. Yeah. And then what about do we not have a voice? Oh my goodness, how could yeah. you suggest that not marginalized? Because yeah, you've always had the voice. You guys yeah. have the voice. Yes, no, you there's the responses. That. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, so that's step, you're not you don't know how to listen, <laughs> and you need mental health care in order to yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, I need mental health care. Um. Wow. Which is ironic because like going to therapy school made me need therapy but right. anyway right so right. i so i see this email with these requests that he has made um which are a they're intentionally almost impossible to fulfill right. the documentation i'm no idiot i've worked in academia there's no way i was going to sign that because that would follow me if i transferred schools right. i'm a, and you had to sign that you were incompetent no way so i filed a grievance with the school and I won the grievance because I proved in my, I wrote a whole, let, basically an essay with cited sources. And I used the counseling uh, department handbook and I proved that he had not followed their own procedure for dis temporarily dismissing a student, which their procedure requires that the student has a panel of a few professors that they have like an hour to share their side of the story and that they're heard by some kind of like not neutral, but you know, a group, a panel of people mm -hmm. that never happened. He just made some decision. Right. And mm -hmm. I know why he made it. I mean, he, somebody had to go down for that because the mob was so loud and I was the easiest person. And he knew that he was in trouble. He had, he had to take a sabbatical. I later learned mm -hmm. who knows why. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was the easy target. Mm -hmm. you know and if he could make an example of me and basically force me out which is what he did then the mob would temporarily be satisfied mm. and so I filed my grievance I won it and I was like technically allowed to come back but one of the problems with that apart from just not feeling like apart from all the things we've talked about was that he was my advisor so I emailed one sympathetic administrator, mildly sympathetic. She didn't seem to really have taken a side in it. And I was like, can I get a different advisor if I come back? You know, it's kind of, I don't want to yeah. deal with it. Like, yeah. 
it's a bias here. Yeah. Yeah. There's total bias. She was like, yeah, you can have this, this woman as your advisor. And, you know, I was, I was very confused for a while. I mean, I really, I hated my experience in the program, but I still like had these delusions about what therapy education was. And I was sad that I wasn't doing it. And I was, you know, still kind of tired of my accounting career. And I was like, I, maybe I should just go back. Maybe it'll be different. You know, I won't be with that year of students or whatever delusions I had. And I emailed this, this other advisor. I remember I emailed her like in November, December of that semester that I was like forced to be away. She didn't answer. I emailed her a couple of times in the spring. She didn't answer. I mean, she ghosted me. Wow. And I emailed her from a few different email accounts too, including the school account. So she, it couldn't have been like spam. And when I later reached out to that this more sympathetic administrator was like, I'm not hearing back from this woman. Like what's going on? She told the woman, Lauren's been emailing you get back to her. I hear back from her. And rather than being like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened or whether that's true or not. Yeah. You know, rather than putting on a good face, she was like, I don't see any of your emails. Where are your emails? Like maybe prove <laughs> like I had to take screenshots of emails and like prove that I'd been trying to email her. And I was just, it was so clear. It was like, they don't want you to come back. Like, they, you know, like I didn't know if I wanted to go back, but it couldn't have been more clear oh. that, that I was not the type of person that they wanted. And welcome. I think that's like really a key point with all of this is that there's a type. Mm -hmm. They want a type right now. I don't know that it used to be that way in therapy education. I didn't go in the nineties. But there's a type that they're looking for. And if you don't fit that box, they hold a lot of power to gatekeep you out. And that, to me, there's there's a legal question in there. Like, do they really have the power to enroll people in programs, take all this tuition money, students who are doing a good job passing all their classes, and then make some kind of decision around their character without good evidence and drive them out of a school? Like, I don't think that that's right, you know? It sounds like the way they did it with you was, was mm -hmm. in a kind of a subtle and soft way. They kind of created passively. excuses and yeah, pa like you said, passively and, and with her ignoring your emails, it's like, we can just get this woman to leave, leave. We can just give her yeah. the cold shoulder until she leaves. Yeah. And so, so they it would be used... your call. Right. And they used, they used techniques that are notoriously crazy making. Yeah. Gaslighting, scapegoating, things that we learned about in class. That's that's what's so twisted to me, you know, is is that these are all licensed therapists perpetuating some of the the social crimes for lack of a better word right now that lead so many of their clients into therapy. Like after this all happened, I was so messed up for like quite a long time. You know, most of my sol solace was through this awesome Canadian podcast called fucking canceled, where they talk about how awful it is to be canceled. And that was like the only space where I felt understood for like a long time. And when I found your stuff in CT, I was like, Oh my God, I'm not totally crazy. But I didn't even feel comfortable finding a therapist. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't feel comfortable around therapists. Why would I? Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Now, when you were getting mobbed, do you know if any of those people who were, who were attacking you online were, were they SARP members? Yeah. I think quite a few of them were really. So these were but the I official don't... squad of uh, against racial privilege. So if they determine that racial privilege means whiteness, whiteness, then they are students against white people, basically yeah. against, okay. against whiteness, you know, yeah. so if yeah. you're, if you're willing to, to live in shame as a white person, maybe, I guess you can be part of that club. I mean, everyone who was accepted as a graduate student with SARP was at least gay. Mm -hmm. There was no there was no straight white person who had one of those positions, mm -hmm. um, which again, like, you know, who cares if that's 
if those happen to be the best students for the position, I don't care, but yeah. it's not like that. It's designed that way, you know? And it was very, um, I don't know. I, I remember that a few of them were definitely part of SARP. I don't know about all of them, but they were certainly all very aligned with that faction of the, of the student body. Well, wow, it's um, like, they're just, they're rabble rousers. They're yeah. the ones to encourage the fray. But I want to mention, like, when you ask about them, I think it's really important for anyone who's listening to know that I, and I know this for a fact, that none of those students were penalized in any way for the way that they wrote to me. Like, I was, I was. Even though that they were coming leave. from an official position. Mm -hmm. Even though, whether they were from, for the ones that were from the posi official position, the ones that weren't, they're, they were all, you know, in this therapy program with me, they were all subject to the same quote unquote gatekeeping rules. They, there was, there were a few in particular, one in particular whose email to me, which was publicly seen by the faculty was so virulent and awful with, like I said, curse words and all sorts of stuff. I mean, you know, my little question versus that completely yeah. different. And I know for a fact that none of those students were reprimanded in any way. None of them were brought in to talk about how they had spoken to me. Nothing. Nothing. They all continued. They all finished. They're all getting their hours. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And That's... I know that from multiple sources. That's not, you know. Yeah. Wow. Wow. What a story. This is, this is like, it it's shades of what I was seeing at, yeah. when I was in school, but it's even more intense. It's even yeah. more blatant and extreme. Yeah. I mean, what I, when I read about your experience, I, I felt this, like when I read yours, I felt the same. I was like, Oh my God, just the way that the school kind of like public, yeah. from what I understood, kind of oh, public yeah. Yeah. against you. Yeah. Called this me a was white done in a much more yeah. passive silent way by the administration itself it was very much yeah. like privately with me like you're not allowed to come back until you do these things they didn't you know the administration didn't publicly shame me that the, the students kind of did yeah but it's it's the same chapter of the same book you know yeah, yeah. and the fact that the fact that radical center exists, the fact that CTA critical therapy antidote exists, the fact that all this stuff exists and that there's so many of us who have stories is proof that this is not just like, Oh, you know, some of us were not fit to be therapists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like you and I are sitting here having a great conversation, listening to each other. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's very sad. Yeah, I've had people say, well, when I first first was putting these videos out and talking about my experience, a lot of people said, well, you chose to go to a radical school. You went to a school that was pretty radical. You should have known. They're super left wing. But the stories have just kept flowing in from yeah. students. It's from from students all over the place. And it's I mean, I've I've talked with a handful of people that have been at Antioch, but far and away it's been from all over different schools yeah. everywhere and you said you encountered this when you transferred out to the school in California what was that was it it looks mm. like uh, maybe it wasn't as intense it wasn't as intense partly because that school was more of a commuter school okay. so it was just kind of like it was a cohort technically but you you encountered like a lot of different people all the time it wasn't, it wasn't as much of a bubble it wasn't much of a club they did not they did not do any like crt boot camp nonsense like that okay. but what i and that's a whole kind of a whole nother topic about what happened at that school but um that that program i the problem that i had there was around transfer credits mm. um and was again the the department had um lied to me it's a long story but she lied to me in writing actually and so i had written proof and i had to like and then she continued lying and they kind of put me in a weird position where it was very hard for me to come back until because of transfer credits until mm -hmm. she solved her lie 
And I had to go to another department to get it solved. And I just, by the end of all of this, I was like, I am so exhausted of just trying to get a degree to help people as a therapist. I'm exhausted. Like, <laughs> you know, but yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't woke stuff. It well, was just. It's really interesting. I haven't really talked very much with people about procedural incompetence in mm. these academic programs, but that's yeah. very much a part of my experience. And I actually wonder if that's more widespread than, you know, it, the, the woke stuff and the culty kind of ideology infiltrating education seems like it is, it's much more alarming, um, procedural issues are mundane and yes. easy to just say, well, you know, there was an issue with this, but I wonder if that's, um, if that really dovetails yeah. more than I've thought about. So I mean, that's interesting that you bring that up because it really, yeah. really matches my experience. Yeah, it was, it was definitely just as disorganized, like the California school was equally disorganized mm -hmm. for sure. Um, mm -hmm. just not as culty, but you know, and cheaper, but still the same kind of feeling of like, what am I paying for? And what are we doing? That mm -hmm. feeling was at both programs of yeah. like, are we learning therapy? <laughs> you know, my mind is pretty blown by your story right now. Thank you for taking the time to go through that narrative. And I, one of the things that I feel is so, um, it's, it's so important right now is the, the thing that you're, you're, speaking to is the selection bias that there's certain kinds of people who are being um, sought after and welcomed and put through these programs. And these are your, these are your therapists. Now, these are the young therapists, we're not, not necessarily young, but the newly trained therapists, they're being trained with this bias. I'm sure not everywhere. I'm sure there are some programs that are actually doing a better job than other programs, but by and large, this is what we're seeing a lot of. Sure. And so it's, it changes the face of this field completely. Yes. And we've Absolutely. come to rely on this field because people are so fractured from families and people live all over the place. And we don't have these broad social networks of support in our real life community. So we've, we have outsourced a lot of that to professionals that, that, that there's been a destigmatize, destigmatization of therapy and counseling so that normal people who are pretty high functioning think of getting a therapist or a counselor to help them through rough spots in life, grief, loss, uh, anxiety, all sorts of things. And very importantly, think of this for resources for their children. My right. kid is going through something. Let me get a therapist. And I, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times, and I'm not a licensed therapist. I do. I have a coaching practice. I can't tell you how often I am approached with people asking me if I'll work with their child. And I, and, and we're talking about young kids, sometimes yeah. teenagers, a lot of times teenagers, but often younger kids. And I think you don't know me and you would put your kid in a room with me Yeah. and for all the, you know, for everyone that, that contacts someone like me, how many are going to licensed therapists and young licensed therapists that are coming straight out of these programs that are being trained in this mindset. And I, it's so alarming to me on so many levels, but one of the ways that it's really alarming is that people like you who are coming in with a more, I would say, I'd say open ideologically neutral position. Yeah. And you're, yeah. you're not, you're, you weren't going through this program. It sounds like saying you guys are wrong. You've got it all wrong. You're no. just asking questions yeah, and not, not flowing into their their program the way that they're fold they're trying to fold you in you're 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 stopping the process a little just by going wait can you explain to me what's going on here so someone like you goes through this and you come out just you said it yourself just you needed therapy to get through the therapy yeah. experience you you come out psychologically screwed up you're confused yeah. you're you you're hurt it's yeah it's socially really traumatic to go through something like that. Yeah. It's the most socially traumatic thing I've ever experienced in my life. I've had, you know, I had some childhood traumas. We, most of us have some kind of trauma, but this one, I mean, it really, it really like derailed my life. It took years from my life, a lot of money, a lot of educational energy, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, like a lot of like trust and faith in higher ed in general. Um, 
it's it's had such a huge impact on me and i think you know and i want to like speak to that briefly because one of the classic lines in a lot of these like attacks that i got was like you have no idea how harmful your question is that question that i asked and i really i i can't say this because i don't talk to any of those people but I really doubt any of them are really thinking about what happened that day. And I still have to deal with it all the time. Mm -hmm. So who's really being harmed? Like the person who gets canceled and ostracized, <clears throat> excuse me, or someone who reads a question that just doesn't align with like yeah. today's social justice quota. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's unconscionable. And and like you said, it's disturbing mm -hmm. because a lot of people out there are, they don't know anything about what's going on in therapy training. Why would they? They're not therapists. They don't know anyone going to therapy school. They just know, okay, therapy is more accepted today. Like you said, I need some help. I need to talk to someone who's not a family member, someone I'm sleeping with or someone I'm drinking with. <laughs> I'm going to go get a therapist, right? Yeah. We've all been there, but um, you know, I mean, I've heard stories about therapy, about therapists now, even like shaming clients in sessions. Mm -hmm. This is like a thing that happens sometimes it's never yep. happened to me, no, but I mean, that, too. that is that kind of behavior, especially if it's around, you know, white guilt or anything like that is definitely stemming from how people are being trained. And that is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. deeply wrong. And I think that licensing boards, even though they're pretty hostile towards therapists in general, but them accreditation boards, you know, all the rational professors who aren't into this, I really think there needs to be more of an up, like they need to speak up because it's become overtaken. I don't even know that, that therapy really exists anymore, to be honest. Wow. Gosh, I, 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 I'm so tempted to like, keep you on and ask you a ton of questions. <laughs> But we I know we, we've, yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, I would love that. It's been, uh, I've taken a lot of your time and okay. it's been I, sure. I'm going to just, I'm going to be thinking about this for a long time. That's the way that you were treated. It's just deranged. Yeah, it is deranged. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I say that without self pity too. You yeah. know, like I've, I've mostly moved on. I mean, it still haunts me, but, but it is deranged. It's messed up. There's no excuse mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's happening just to listeners who have, who might stumble upon this, who are not associated with therapy, but like to send the empathy out there, this happens to people in a lot of fields now, you know, there's a lot of people who have had their lives destroyed because they asked one question the wrong way because they looked at someone the wrong way because they used one wrong word mm -hmm. that they didn't know was wrong maybe because their age or whatever mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and it's we are creating a society where there's no forgiveness no empathy no mercy for anything and it's it's completely antithetical to the entire mental health profession in my opinion mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah. Now, are you still not on social media or is there somewhere where people could follow you if they want to connect with your work um, or your, what you're doing? So I'm a writer. I have been for my whole life and I have a sub stack, um, which I can send you the link. Maybe you yeah. can put that. Yeah. Um, I'll be happy to put I do it have a sub stack. It's not about this really. It's a lot of like, um, fiction, memoir stuff, poetry, but I have that, um, I have an ancient Facebook that's completely not true in <laughs> my current life. And yeah, that's pretty much it. But I also, um, I did do an interview with CTA and I wrote the story about what happened to me up there. So that's available if anyone okay. wants to reread it or use it as kind of like <laughs> evidence. Or yeah, something. I'll put those yeah. links in the description yeah. of this video. Yeah. Or if you're listening to it on a podcast, it'll be in the podcast yeah. description. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Cool. And you're a part of solid ground with us, which is really nice. It's great to have yeah. you there. Yeah. So. It's great to have it's I can't even tell you like how amazing it was to find you guys. That was a great day for me because I felt so much less. I knew I wasn't crazy. 
Mm-hmm. I have enough sense of self to know that. But when you're, when you go through something like that, that's so particular and so weird and so awful, mm-hmm. it's easy to kind of feel like you're the only one and something must be wrong with you. Mm-hmm. And when I found you guys and all these stories, I was just like, oh my God, I'm, this is definitely an issue, you know? Yeah. It's hitting a lot of people. Yeah. As you say, mm-hmm. well, thank you for taking this time. And thank you yeah. for sharing your story. And um, I've you. really enjoyed talking with you. And thank I just, I'm I'm grateful that you took the time to do this because I think that this is such a, it's such a blaring and concrete example of how this is being implemented in the educational process and the impacts that that can have on students and the impacts that that's going to have on wider society, I think are, are obvious mm-hmm. and dreadful. So and will become more so, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Leslie. Thanks, Lauren.